Okay, so everyone's coming in. What's going on, everybody? Say hello to Venus. Let us know where you're from in the chat. We like to know where people are watching from. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. And also let, let us know if you can hear us too, because that's always a fear of mine that we don't, that they don't hear me. Type in the chat where you're from. Say hello. Hello. Oh, from Texas, Kansas. What else we got? Texas, Ridgewood, New Jersey. What's up, Bridgewood? That's where I'm from. Minnesota, Charlotte. That's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. We had almost 300 people register for this. So we just want to give wow. it a second. Yeah. 300 people probably don't show up. They want to get the recording when it's done, but yeah. but that's nice that they showed up, that they registered. We are California, live. California. Oh, we're on Facebook now? Jake, you always do that to me. I'm singing a song. <laughs> I said it. All right, everyone. Hey, how is it going? I'm Nick Baldwin, LCA co-founder, and I'm really excited to do this interview today with Venus Griffin. She has such an amazing story, an uplifting story, a story that I think is going to give a lot of you uh, a lot of hope and motivation and inspiration. The things that she's gone through um, are incredible uh, from growing up, um, you know, around, uh, you know, abuse and drugs and being almost homeless in her when she was 14. Uh, and now she is one of the top producing real estate professionals in the entire country. Uh, so thank you so much for being here, Venus. I also want to say, if you go to venusmorrisgriffin.com, you can get on the join the wait list for her new book, which I just did that before the webinar. I joined the wait list. Nice. So jump over there and get on that wait list for the book called Validated. How's it going, Venus? It's great. I'm excited to be here. I've heard great things about you guys and I'm excited to to share my story and I hope to really help other people that are struggling in the real estate business and um, on a personal level, maybe in their, their own lives. So. Yeah, hundred percent. We, You and I spoke briefly before this and we were talking about how it's so important that, um, you know, leaders in our industry speak up about, you know, personal obstacles, any mental challenges they might be going through because it can really resonate, especially now because 2020 was such a crazy year and a lot of people had a difficult year financially and mentally. So I'm glad you're on here with me. Um, so, you know, why don't, let's start with, I don't want to dwell too much on the past, right? But I think people sure. should know a little bit about the, sure. the surroundings that you grew up in as a child. So can sure. you, let's get started with that. So, you know, when I was a, a, a young child, I, um, very difficult, dysfunctional, family, I had a great mother that struggled with uh, addictions, um, prescription drug addictions, alcohol addictions. And, um, you know, my whole life uh, was filled uh, with, with honestly, just lots of trauma and devastation. Um, one of my youngest uh, memories that I have is when I was small, my job was to watch my mother um, when she was laying on the couch to watch her fingernails and if her fingernails started turning blue, that meant that I needed to call 911 um, because she would obviously not be breathing. Um, and then just escalating from that, you know, I had a brother and a sister and, you know, I just remember um, growing up where like in the mornings and it was cold, we'd put like blankets over the the doors with the fireplace in there, or, you know, not wanting friends to come over because when you turn on the kitchen light, you've got like hundreds of roaches going everywhere. And, um, you know, my mom, when she was really good, she was really good, but, you know, um, just getting on the school bus and being made fun of because your hair is not brushed and coming home from school and your mom still being in bed hadn't got up. It was just very, very difficult watching her going in and out of um, mental facilities and um, even getting arrested for insurance fraud. And, um, you know, I had a great brother who grew up with the same, you know, atmosphere. And, you know, we all deal with adversity differently. And um, he was in and out of boys' homes, um, you know, from early childhood until um, he was 
sentenced to maximum security prison for breaking and entering in a guy's house and nearly killing him. And so he was a great, great person who just could not get out of that cycle. You know, you you keep repeating the cycle. Same thing with my sister. She um, was a sweet soul, but just couldn't, you know, get past the dysfunction. You know, my last memory of her is visiting her in a mental hospital where she's trying to tell me she's um, working there when she's actually a patient, lost her children uh, when they were very small. No one has seen her in 15 years plus. But, you know, I knew these behaviors weren't normal and I knew um, that I wanted to be different and I wanted to get out of it. I didn't know how to do that. So at a young age, I just made the decision to try to make a good decision with everything that I did. I, you know, I, um, I studied hard in school, although my grades by no means were perfect because it was, you know, it was, it was just hard to survive. Um, I, um, I went to high school in three years, graduated. I took a summer school class because I knew if I could get out of the cycle of abuse, I thought I, you know, I thought I could change my life for the better. You know, you do everything right and everything good's going to happen to you. So I switched high schools, I think six times in three years. Um, and, um, you know, I graduated and, you know, at the age of 14, 15, you know, I was living with friends trying to figure out, you know, I lived with this friend until I, you know, felt like I was out doing my welcome. And then I'd go back and I'd live with my sister and then I'd flip flop and go live with my mother until she had an episode, you know, and you know, like I said, my mother, I'm not throwing her under the bus. She was a wonderful person, but she just struggled her whole entire life um, due to these um, substance abuses. And um, yeah. yeah, so, um, you know, went to college and thought, you know, work two jobs, put myself through school, waitress at um, California Dreamin', Western Sizzlin, Steakhouse, nannied in between that. And, um, and, you know, that's where I thought, okay, I've got life figured out now. You know, I've gotten out of the cycle of abuse. I made a decision early on to this day. I've never tried a drug, um, even including marijuana, because I, I was nervous that if I ever ventured to that side, I'd end up like my family who all had mm. the addictions. So yeah. can I ask you a quick question about that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, by the time you were 15, you had experienced a lifetime. And I would, I'm just curious, like, you know, that being that age, was is such an impressionable age right yeah. um like recently uh dmx passed away and he i, I saw he was a, a a well-known rapper and i saw an interview with him talking about how his life started going downhill when at 14 years old a mentor of him of his uh gave him uh crack and mm -hmm. at 14 he tried crack and that was that was the end for him yeah and he yeah. passed away just recently at 50. And so uh, I'm curious, like, how did you stay away from that at such a young, impressionable age? Well, you know, I, I saw, I didn't know what the right thing to do was, but I saw everyone around me falling apart. You know, I saw my brother going, you know, he's getting arrested for putting steaks down his pants in a grocery store. I mean, who does that? You know, right. going to boys' homes to going to prison. And I'm like, okay, I don't know what to do, but I know what not to do. So I try to look at people and emulate um, other families that had healthy families and try to say, okay, what are they doing differently um, than my family? And, um, you know, nothing really special, but just trying to really just to survive. I knew if I could survive and get independent, because you kind of got to get away from all of that um, in order to break the cycle. You can't stay in that kind of abuse in those environments. And, and break free of it, you've got to separate yourself. So that was my goal, just to try to figure out a way to separate myself. And I'm honestly, you know, I didn't know my father, I was born out of an adultery affair. My mother had an affair and, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I really had no one to turn to. My family, 90% of them lived in trailers and, you know, they all smoked pot and drank and really none of them were educated. My mom uh, was a nurse, she got her nursing degree, uh, you know, after I went back to school, but she was smart enough to figure out how to use that nursing degree to get, you know, Doravon, Percocet, the drugs that she needed to sedate herself to get through her life. And, you know, her first husband, who I thought was my father until I was 17, you know, he was schizophrenic, had like, you'd go in his house. I visited him until I was, um, you know, till he died because mm -hmm. I thought he was my dad, but, you know, you'd go in and you have 20 locks down his door. And so he'd undo 20 locks and let you in. And, you know, he 
shot her. She's trying to stab him. It's just like this crazy upbringing. And then you just, you know, but, but again, they're good people in their own way. They just, this is what all they know. Mm -hmm. And so they continue to repeat the pattern, you know, like my brother, he, his son ended up in prison. Both of them were in prison. You know, they just continue doing what they've learned. And, and I just knew, I didn't know what to do, but I knew if I could break out of it and get to college, then, then maybe I would have a shot to, to change my life and to have a different future. So that's what I did. So, I mean, that's, that's amazing. And, 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 and you're, and mentally we can learn so much from, you know, how you were overcoming it. So you did go to college. Yep. So, um, I graduated from the university of South Carolina and um, got a degree in political science. And that is where I met the love of my life. Um, and he was from where I live now, um, Augusta, North Augusta. And um, we dated about a year and a half and um, married and I moved back to his hometown. And, you know, I thought at that point, I'm like, you know, I've beaten this. I've got this amazing husband you know, everybody thought we were Barbie and Ken. We did everything together. You know, um, he worked for the family business. You know, I, um, as we started having children, you know, he was the football coach. He was the basketball coach. I was the PTO president, the youth minister at our church. I thought that, um, you know, I had beaten the cycle. I'd figured it out. And, um, you know, that, I was set, you know, I, I was going to have a great life and, um, and, you know, I tell people your life can change in 10 seconds and good things happen to bad people and you have to decide what you're going to do with that. Um, so, um, we were married nearly 20 years and, um, still very difficult. We were married 20 years and, um, I, I thought we had a really good marriage. He had his own mental health issues and was diagnosed with being bipolar. And, um, but, you know, I was willing to work through that because all of that's very treatable and um, it's not so uncommon these days, um, but it was still an abusive marriage. So I didn't recognize how abusive it was because of my childhood. It was so much better than what I had grown up with, you know? Um, and so, um, you know, literally my life changed in 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. We, um, we had six children together. Um, he could not have children. So we had a donor and, um, I get a call from a prostitute in the middle of the night. And, um, she basically says, you know, I've been blackmailing your husband and we've taken everything that you have. And I just want to tell you what an awful man you're married to and, um, you know, ask me anything, I'll tell you anything. And so I said, well, you know, I, I didn't believe her because we were like Barbie and Ken mm -hmm. is what people, you know, yeah. tagged us. And we had lunch together every day. We were on the front row at church together, like every Sunday we, I mean, we did everything together. So I really didn't believe her. And so I said, you know, would you be open to me? Um, meeting with you. Can I come where you're at right now? Where Where are you? And I'll I'll drive to you. My husband was out of town on a on a business meeting, and so at the time I had um, I woke my 15 year old son up. He was the oldest, and I said, you know, honey, will you um, watch your brothers and sisters? They were all sleeping, and and I'll be back shortly. And at the time I had I was still nursing the baby. I had a one year old, a three year old, an eight year old a 10 year old, 12 or 13 year old, and then my son was 15. So I remember like it was yesterday, just driving down Washington Road, thinking, you know, who is this lady trying to take my family away from me? And, you know, I was driving there with the intent of saving my husband. I thought, you know, I'm gonna figure out why she's trying to hurt, her, hurt us and trying to slander my husband. And then um, I'm gonna, you know, come up with a game plan after that. And so when I got to the hotel, I, um, I'll never forget, I knocked on the door and she comes through the door and she was this very tiny, very young girl. 
and you know she's kind of fidgeting from head to toe and and I just remember looking at her and I thought oh my god you know here's this young girl you could tell she was wounded and I just you would think I would hate her but I just it's like I had this instant connection with her because I could see like in her eyes the tragedy and devastation that she had been through because no one no woman prostitutes themselves out like that for um you know if they're mentally sound right and so I'll go in the hotel room looking back now I think that was like probably not the smartest thing I've ever done but I go in the hotel room and you know so at this point I'm still trying to figure out what her motivation is and and she's got her cell phone and, and she starts to show me pictures and she's showing me pictures of my husband in compromised positions naked driving down the road just things that you would like never imagine but at this point I'm like okay she's she's not lying you know so I'm like trying to process okay how is this possible um and so then 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 her phone rings and she turns the phone to me and it's my husband calling and um she hands me the phone and I answer it and I was just absolutely I could barely talk I was devastated I'm like you know how could you do this how could you do this to our family to our children you know it's just like something out of a movie you 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 know and yeah in, in like 10 seconds I'm like oh my god what am I gonna what am I gonna do you know I was a stay-at-home mom you know she told me they'd taken everything that we had out of our kids accounts our accounts and we were you know we were just blue collar paycheck to paycheck people we weren't we didn't have a lot of money but um you know I had six kids and I had no job and you know, I just remember I left and um, I had zero animosity towards her. And I just remember like as a woman connecting with her thinking, you know, my husband's issues are his issues. You're like, you're trapped in that same awful cycle. Her mother was like the leader of this prostitution ring, like right in my backyard in Augusta, it's like insane. So I leave the hotel and I'm driving back to my children and of course, my husband is outrageous, furious, just trying to blame her. And I'm like, you know, what, you know, what do you, what do you do? But I remember driving home thinking, okay, you know, I say I'm a Christian and I say that I'm going to do the right thing. And, you know, sex addiction is no different than alcohol addiction. It's no different than um, drug addiction. And I'm going to fight for my marriage. You know, I've got six kids and you know, I'd been through such hard times. I knew that if I worked really hard and I tried and I trusted in God and I did everything I needed to do that, that I could save my marriage. And, and, and I said, I'm going to be an example to the community that, you know, this is really awful, but it's not going to define us. And it's not going to be the worst thing that's happened. I'm going to help my husband that I've been married to for nearly 20 years. I'm going to help him get over this and I'm not going to personalize it and make it about me that I didn't do something right. I'm going to help him with his mental health and, and we're going to be stronger and better. And I'm going to raise my family. And I was committed to keeping my family together, you know, short of, short of a disaster. So, you know, called his parents. He has very wonderful parents. And of course they're like me, they're like, there's, you know, they didn't believe it. Um, but they uh, sent him to Hattiesburg, Mississippi, where he um, where he was treated for sex addiction. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, over the next month or two, and you can stop me if you need to. I know I'm rambling. No, that's the, fine. Over the next month or two, you know, he was treated for sex addiction. And part of um, coming clean with any addiction, you have to kind of con confess everything that you've done wrong. And you know, he basically confessed his whole life was a lot of me. You know, I thought he had played football at the University of South Carolina. All that was made up. I, you know, just really everything. I thought he had a tumor that he he took a semester. That was all my, everything was like made up. I'm like, who is this man yeah. I'm married to? So um, while he's in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, the therapist calls me and she says, you know, I think we've got some other really big issues. Um, 
one thing leads to another. They, um, they, uh, sorry. they, um, they, they give him a lie detector test mm -hmm. and, um, for some really awful things that, uh, they, that they thought yeah, he they had done mm -hmm. and he failed it. And they gave him another one because he's like, Oh, they were missing something. They did it wrong. So they gave him another one. They're like, ma'am, you need to, there's this place in Atlanta that is called a specific issue lie detector test. And that one's like 99%. So you need to, you know, get him there. And if that comes back and, and he, he fails this, then, then we know he's done these really awful things. Mm -hmm. And so I remember it was a thousand dollars for that test. And I was like, praying to God that my credit card would take a thousand dollars. Cause we were like, like broke. Yeah. I mean, we didn't have anything. And so when the, uh, God that administered the test calls me. He's like, ma'am, you know, I don't know how to tell you this, but your husband has done all of these things. And, you know, I mean, everybody, it, it was like someone you didn't know. I mean, it was it's like someone, you know, person. yeah. And so and the authorities were, were, the authorities were notified and, um, he went, um, they, they arrested him and mm -hmm. he went to, uh, he, he went on trial and um, he was uh, sentenced uh, to 45 years in, in prison. And I mean, I just, it's like, what do you do with that? The you question know? I have is, because you're remarried now. Mm -hmm. The question I have is, how do you trust somebody again to marry them? Like, what did you, not not like, not in a way of like, how could you? It's a way of how did you get your mind to that point? Because you have, you are obviously a very strong person. Uh, you've been through just one, one incident after the other and mentally to be able to trust someone again and let them in, I imagine is very difficult. How did you get to that point? So, you know, I just made it, you know, because of my childhood being so awful, I, I learned at a young age to not let somebody else define who I was, but I just really made the decision that I wasn't going to let his mental illness create one within me and that I wasn't going to look at myself and say, what could have I done better? So he didn't do all this stuff. And, you know, it was very, very hard, but I just, I just made that decision. And I said, you know, if I go down, my kids go down. Right. And, and then my kids will repeat the pattern again. So here I am like working my whole life to, to break the pattern. And my husband of nearly 20 years is just sentenced to 45 years in prison, not eligible for parole for 21 years. We're like broke. I'm in a two bedroom, you know, have no money. My family's in trailers. I don't, I don't even know how I'm going to meet their basic needs at this point. And I'll never forget, you know, driving home from the courthouse, watching them shackle him and take him away. And he, I'll never forget, he turns around, he looks at me, he says, I'm sorry. And they take him off. And I drove home and I'll never forget. I just, I said, I was six kids down. One year old, I was still nursing the baby to 15. I said, you know, the first thing we're going to do as a family is that we're going to forgive your dad. And we are never going to talk bad about him because mental illness is a real thing. We can make him out of this awful person. What he did was awful, but we're going to not go there. We're just going to forgive him. And, and I am going to take care of you. I don't know what that means, but I'm going to, I know my work ethic. I know what I've done. And I had just got my real estate license not too long before that. And I said, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know what the future is, but I know I'm your mom and I know I'm not going to stop fighting and we're going to be okay. And we're going to show the community that with God and hard work and determination that you can get through anything. And at the, the time, my, my oldest son, who was 15, he's like, mom, he said, you do everything you need to do. And I will help raise my brothers and sisters. You take care of us. And so that was my journey, you know, my divorce attorney, because I filed for divorce, like immediately, once I got that information, he says, you know, Venus, you know, what are your, what's your plan? You know, what do you, what do you, what are you going to do? He says, you know, in case you don't know, you don't get child support from prison, your family's broke, 
he says, you need to, you, I know you just got your real estate license on ago, but you need to, you need to get a real job. You got six kids depending on you. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know what, Tim, I'm okay doing that. I said, but you don't know what I've got into me. You know, I have been through really hard times in my life. And I know if I lay this cross down, my kids pick it up. And so I'm going to first try. I'm going to try and I'm going to see what I can do. And then if I fail, then I'll get a real job and I'll quit this real estate dream. But but I knew that, you know, I knew what I had into me. And I said, you know, that first year, my my divorce attorney said, Venus, what do you what are you taking to get you through this? I said, well. I'm not opposed to taking anything. I think medicine is amazing. I said, but right now I get up every day. I run five miles. I take care of my mental health first and my physical health. And that got my endorphins going. And then I got all six of my children up and I took them to church every morning for five days a week before school at seven o'clock because I knew I really didn't know what to do, but I knew that I couldn't do it by myself. And it couldn't hurt me by going to church every day. And, um, you know, I just tried to do the right things, even though it was hard and I didn't want to do it. I did it. And then I would cut, we would take the kid, I would take the kids to school and then I would start my work day. And I worked 70 hours a week easy. Um, and, and, and then I, every day I would schedule like 530 to seven or six to seven I made sure that I took that time and I had family dinner with my kids because what I didn't want to do is become this really successful person and make them think that money was more important than, than my love for them or that that was my, what I worship, you know? And so I made them a priority and I, we would go around every night, almost every night and, and tell a good thing or not so good thing. So, you know, between just kind of self-care keeping my faith, what that meant for me, and then, you know, making my children feel like they were a priority. I started this journey in real estate and and I had one shot, you know. My uh, in-laws were very nice to me and they, for about six months after he went to prison, they gave me his check and then that was it. You know, it was, it was sink or swim and that's kind of when you know what you're made of. And well, I you, just know, you, said something, you said something really important that I think a lot of people can learn from, you know, you have to take care of yourself first yeah. um, and you have to make sure that you're strong uh, because if you're not strong, then your kids will see that and it will fall onto your kids. And you just made a choice to just completely change your life around. Like there was no other, you have no other choice. You have six little mouths that, need to be fed and you know they depend on you and so yeah i mean you went into real estate first of all in 2007 2008 which was you know in itself um crazy right because this was the worst financial uh economy of probably our lifetime as long as we can remember um and you just you just it, you had no other choice but to make it work because you had these little people depending on you um and I think that that's hugely commendable. Um, a lot of people would have just given up, you know, even if they had those kids. Yeah, so, well, here. you know, I <clears throat> I didn't know what was the future was going to hold, but I just remember thinking that the most, it's like you got to put the oxygen mask on yourself on the airplane right, right. before you can kind of yeah. help it. I knew if I went under that they would go under. And I knew that whatever I did, the leap that i set for them is what they would do now I was not perfect I'm still not perfect but I tried my best to be the best mother I could be you know we lived in a two-bedroom and lived there for three years and I just was committed to I was not gonna let my kids grow up the way I did you know and I just remember when I would drop them off at school I would put a suit on and and I would like just ride around and knock on doors and basically just say, listen, you know, I want to list your house. I'll do anything. You know, I will be the best real estate agent you've ever had. And then I would, then I would actually do what I told them that I would do. I would do the follow-up. I would do an amazing job. Then I would sell the house. Then I would like, and then they would tell somebody, look at this 
this woman who's got six kids, she's like amazing. And then I would do it again. And then every Sunday I would call other agents and say, can I do an open house for you? You know, I just, I'll do it for free. I just want to go in there and, yeah. and try to try to figure this real estate business out. And, you know, people would come into the open house and, you know, I just wouldn't sit there when they would come in. I would like talk to them. I'd get to know them. I would, I would know about their children, their family, what they like, why they're here. You know, I'd become their friend before they left the door yeah. and I would actually sell houses at open houses, which people say doesn't happen. It does happen. I would sell them. And then when I didn't sell houses, I would still get buyers there. And so, yeah. you know, just, it's, it's just like a trickle effect. And, you know, my, my, I'll never forget my assistant. I was so broke. I couldn't even pay her the first year she worked for me. She was my best friend. She was with me through the trial. She knew everything that was what she said, you know, Venus, don't worry about paying me the first year. I know you'll catch me up. I'll feed your family if I have to. You do what you need to do to take care of your family. And so that's what I did. You know, the, I'll never forget my first year in the business, you know, well, my first part of a year, I think I made like 20,000, but my first full year, I made $100,000. And then my second year, you wow. know, this is in the recession when everybody yeah. is getting out. My attorney's like, Venus, you're crazy. You need to get a, you're college educated, get a real job. My second year, I'm making 200. My third year, I'm like, three, 400. My fifth year, I'm hitting half a million. Yeah. By year seven, I'm grossing a million, you know, eight, nine. Now I gross, you know, if I'm not making a hundred to 250,000 a month, I like think something's wrong. But can but, I just say something, Venus? <laughs> I want to back up a minute because there's a lot of things we can learn from this. Uh, you know, listen, we have a community of, of 130,000 plus agents and listen, and I'm not, I'm not, what I'm about to say isn't news, right? Yeah. Um, agents are victims. They, they yeah. feel like if they're not going to succeed, if they can't succeed, it's someone else's fault. Right? right. And what you're saying is, well, we like to say, okay, listen, every day when you wake up, you have to act like if you don't go and make some money today, you're going to be broken, let everybody down. Right. Yeah. And so that was actually happening to you. Yes. And what did you do? You went out and knocked on doors. You did open houses. You called other agents. And that strategy still works today, even in the age of technology. Yes. Still works today. Mm -hmm. If you do something every single day, like your life depended on it, there's going yeah. to be a positive outcome. I, you can't, in this business, I tell people, I am no one special. I'm really not. You can't not be successful. If you work your hardest every day, you're not going to see results day one, day two. I give the analogy of my daughter taking me to work out to try to get me really in shape a few years ago. And she says, mom, we're going to go to the gym at five o'clock every morning. You're going to lift weights for an hour and a half to two hours. And then by eight months, you'll start to see some results. I'm like, what? You want me to go work out? And lift weights for eight months to start. So I didn't believe that I would actually get a six pack, but I remember I'm like, you know, I want to support my daughter. Yeah. And and because she wanted to maybe be a personal trainer to people, but I'm like almost 50 and I've had seven kids. And and so I went every day and I just remember month one, two, three, you know, I'm not seeing anything. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna keep doing because I love my daughter. You know, I want to support her, whatever that means. F month four, I'm not seeing anything. Month five, month six, I'm like, oh my God, I think I'd see like a a little one pack, you know, <laughs> month seven years, I'm seeing like a two and literally by month eight, nine, you know, I've got a legit six pack. And, and the same as with real estate, you might not see the results when you start. So many people get into this business and they think, I am not made to do this. This is awful. I'm making nothing, but they don't every day. If you get up and you're determined and you do, it doesn't have to be like brain surgery. You get up my, I built millions of simple things. You know, the internet's powerful and there's more, more than one way to build millions. It's not just my way of open houses and like knocking on doors and calling everybody I know and telling them how great I am. There's more, there's, you just hit Google how to be a great real estate agent. Focus on what fits your personality. Yeah. You will be successful. There's no way you can't be. The only way you will not be successful is if you are lazy and you don't put the work in. And when I say I'm nobody special, 
every single person watching me can do more than me because they probably don't have seven children. And I, like I said, now I make 150 a month. Easy. I can make $100,000 with my eyes closed. And, and it didn't happen in one night. You know, right. it's years. And now it's easier. Um, it's easier for me because I've developed a reputation. I've got a work ethic. So the longer you're in it, you know, the, the harder you work, the luckier you get. So you just have to know you got to focus on the 10% yeses and don't worry about the 90% no's that you might get. That's a great piece of advice because because un, unfortunately, um, you know, our mind, our brain uh, jumps right to the negative, right? Our, yes. That's just, we're conditioned. It's very hard to think positively. And when it comes to, you know, uh, lead generating, it can be very, uh, it can break you down, right? Because you're yes. going to hear a lot of no's, more no's, and you're going to hear yeses. And so if you go for the no, yeah. then- you don't have to worry about that person anymore. You're yeah. just going through the no's until you get to the yes. And that yes could be 10,000, 20,000, whatever it is, right? Yeah. Well, uh, one, so of best, that. Yeah, that, one of the I best that pieces of advice is I got from a, a client of mine who's like a multi multi millionaire. He says, you know, Venus, I built my, I built my success on 90 to 95% no's. You got to focus on the 5 to 10% yeses. Yeah. Because, you know, when I came up in the business, there was this lady, Claire Stone, who was the top agent. And I just remember looking at her. She had grace, dignity, class, and I wanted to be like her. And as I rose up and, and eventually taking that number one spot, I didn't take away her success at all. You know, right. there's room for us all to be successful. I say, don't tear, don't tear your fellow agents down. If you work hard, you can all be successful. You have to decide what you want, what that means. I never intended on making the kind of money I make. And honestly, I don't think money and what you make define success. I think your success is defined by the relationships you have, your family. And as long as you meet your basic needs, whatever that means for you, whatever your goal is, that I think that, you know, you can achieve that level of happiness. So. Yeah, no, I think that's fantastic. I would love to know, you know, so what is like a normal or what does your day, what does your day look like in the morning? So you get up at 5 a.m., right? So like this morning, so I got up at five o'clock. Well, today was different because my kids have filled day, but okay. So yesterday I got up at five o'clock. I go to the gym. I get home at seven. Um, then I turn the bath on for my five-year-old, put her in there. Um, and my husband gets up and he's usually in the shower or whatever. I go in there and like my daughter wanted pancakes and bacon. I don't fix that every morning, but I do fix them breakfast every morning. So I fixed her that, get them ready for school, make sure their hair is brushed, their teeth brushed, get their backpacks, fix their lunches, get them out of the door at eight o'clock. And then I go to work, you know, yeah. at eight 30, I'm going to work. And sometimes that means I work from my office at home, but, but I prefer to go to my office building. And then I'm there today. We had field day. So they reserve, you know, nine 30 to, you know, whatever time, an hour and a half to for field day. And so I was there at my kids' activities. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, I go on listing appointments. I show houses, um, writing. Now I have five assistants. So they do all the busy work for five me. Five assistants. I have five assistants now, That's which is, which is they... another great piece of advice is, you know, I knew that as a real estate agent, once I hit, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars a year or a hundred thousand, even I knew that I, I wanted to be bigger because I just, I wanted to be bigger. I wanted to see what I could do. And so I remember hiring an assistant in my broker saying, you know, you don't really need an assistant yet. And I said, but you know what, if I don't have an assistant, then I, I don't grow. I'm stagnant. So if I get an assistant, then I can get more business and then get another assistant, get then more business. And so now I have a listing coordinator who, when I get a listing, she goes, organizes photos, measures the house, gets it online for me. I have a closing coordinator. Once it goes into contract, she takes it from contract to close. I have someone that just checks my emails all day. I have someone who does all oh, of wow. the business parts. I have a web, part, you know, so you, you got to, you know, in, you got to live the more money you make. I didn't spend that money. I reinvested it in me and my business. You know, I don't go out and yeah. you know, blow it. You've got to reinvest well, you know, it. I love you. that you have an assist. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I was no, ahead. no, you've got to be willing to be broke. And, and no, I think a lot of the younger mentality thinks I want instant gratification. I want this. I deserve this. I'm working hard. You got to know 
I always say the first five years in this business, you just got to be prepared to do the grunt and to be broke and to be hell bent on succeeding and, and reinvesting. I was the first person in Augusta to ever put a billboard up. I've got billboards all, all over the community. I'm like, like semi, like, I don't want to say famous, but everybody knows who I am. Now there's, <laughs> yeah, there's 50 billboards. Of, yeah. There's 50 billboards of different agents. You know, everyone kind of copies what I do. It's, it's, it's the biggest compliment. And it's also, you know, like sometimes I'm like, okay, come up with your own idea, but it's a really big compliment and you just yeah. have to reinvest in yourself you got to brand yourself. You got to, you got to want to be different. You know, when people copy me, I'm thinking, you don't want to copy me. You want to find what makes you different. And you want to use that difference to, to set you apart from all your competitors. You know, I never liked my name, Venus. I mean, I was like, you know, when I was younger, now I use that. There's only one Venus in Augusta, you know, and, and right. I use that to my advantage, but you know, you just have to find what makes you different and you got to capitalize on it. I got a new ta uh, a new uh, tagline for your business, Venus. Your experience will take you to the moon and back. I don't know. I'm just trying to think of <laughs> something silly like that. Um, no. So there's a question here, and before yeah. I get to Amanda's question, I just want to say you have five assistants, which to a lot of agents is like what five? Yeah. But each one has a specialty. Yes, each right? one has each a specialty. One does something different. And yes. That is, is, is huge because, you know, that allows you to basically only go on appointments, which is all you should be yeah, doing because that's money-making activity. Yes. It's amazing. Yeah. I think last month in this pandemic, I think we had, my sister told me like 50 transaction side closings at one time in one month. It's crazy. So there's one question from Facebook though about that. So Dawn Maloney, she's wondering, okay, so the assistants are listing coordinator, closing coordinator. They check email, one does your marketing. And what was the other one? Um, marketing, listing, closing. Um, I've got one yeah. that does all my financials. Emails, marketing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So finances, got it. Okay. So yeah. like a CFO type of thing. Yes. Um, that's, that's amazing. And um, Amanda Smith has a question for you. What advice okay. do you have for single realtor moms? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Am I breaking up a little bit? You're breaking right, up a little bit, but okay. I can still hear you. What advice? Okay. Amanda wants to know what do you, advice do you have for single realtor moms on how to balance family and work responsibilities? So I, what I did was I, you, you've got to commit to getting out of your comfort zone and you got to know that it's going to be hard and you got to know that um, it's okay that it's hard. It doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong and you got to be okay with that feeling. Cause sometimes when things are really difficult, we think we're doing something wrong when, when it's just the opposite. That means we're progressing, we're getting better. And in what I did with my kids is I programmed appointments for them. You know, like even now to this day, you can count on one hand. I don't miss soccer games. I don't miss baseball games. I don't miss anything like it. Field day to day, you know, I'm selling 60 million plus a year, but my assistants, yeah. they have the calendars for all my kids' events. They are programmed in. And when, when I have clients, I don't say, oh, I got to go to a soccer game because that works against you. I just say I have an appointment, which is the honest truth because my kids are important and you want to keep that balance. You don't want to ever, you know, have this success and then your kids never see you at a football game or basketball game or, you know, whatever, you know, I worked till my daughter had um, her pinning set. She, I've got four in college and my fourth child had her pinning ceremony for her um, college. And, you know, I worked to nine o'clock that night. So I drove an hour and a half. I get there at 1030. I'm going out with her at the bars because that's what all the parents are doing. Dancing with her, laughing with her, having, you know, it was hard and going to bed at one and then getting back up the next day and, and coming back home and, and managing the other kids. It's, it's hard, but it is the most amazing feeling when you look in the mirror every day and you know, my life is hard, but it is great. You know, it is, you know, look, I just did a $600,000 pool renovation in my backyard, paid for in cash. What? I live, I live in a million, $2 million house, depending on, you know, it's paid for in cash. I've paid four children. I've got one in dental school, cost me a hundred thousand a year. I paid for it in cash. I work hard 
it is difficult. I haven't watched TV probably in, I'd say my friends would say 10 years because, you know, it's just a waste of my time and energy. I focus on my children. Well, there, my and there is no time. Yeah, There's children, no my family, you know, and and then, yeah. you know, work. I, I, I'll tell you another thing. I love what I do. I, you know, I tell my clients, I'm up at five, I'm gone, I'm in bed at 10. And if I don't return a text, either I'm dead or I'm in an area where I haven't gotten a text. Because, you know, I've committed, this is, I love what I do. And it's never a burden for me to, you know, be there for my clients. And in real estate, it's the largest financial transaction most people make in their entire lives. And so it's like, you're a therapist also. You know, I tell my clients, they'll call me on a Sunday afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry, Brian, the weekend. I said, listen, if I make you feel like you're bothering me, you need to fire me and get another agent because this is important, you know? And so I, I, I try to treat all of my clients and make them feel like they're my only client. Well, it's, it sounds like, you know, great being grateful. This is what you're saying. Be grateful to a, any client or person that co comes into your life. We see a lot of agents, especially on social media, complaining about their clients. Yeah. Right. When there are 1.5 million realtors mm -hmm. in this country and 80% of them don't sell a single house and you got picked and you're complaining, yeah. listen, yeah. everybody, look, it's not that you can't vent. Everyone has a bad day, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, this person could have chosen anybody, anyone to buy and sell a house with it. And they chose you and bring, bring home some money and put food on the table. Here's what I would say to that. You know, I have lots of very difficult clients because I do a lot of transactions. So just by the law of averages, we're all created the same, but we're all different in the same hand. I really think that the very difficult clients are a gift to me because they give me an opportunity to be better. And if, you know, anybody can do the easy stuff. That's what I say. You know, that's what I said with my first husband. I said, anybody can do it when it's easy, but you will set yourself apart. If you can figure out how to get that hard ass to respect you and like you, because that person is going to rave about you. And, you know, I tell my assistants all the time, the mm -hmm. client's always right. Even if we know they're wrong, their perception is their reality. And so we have to change their perception and help them through this, this process. People manage stress differently. And if you know that you're not going to personalize it, just like I didn't personalize the sex addiction and make it think it was me. I'm not going to personalize my client. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they shouldn't be yelling at me. They shouldn't. But occasionally that happens because they just lose it because of all of the stresses they have. What I do is I step back and say, you know, they're just having a hard time. It's not me. I'm going to, my, my assistant said, Venus, call this person. You can defuse them in 10 seconds where they're sitting there just like this. And in 10 seconds, they're diffused because I don't take it like they're, they don't, you know, they don't appreciate me. I take it like, okay, yeah. I got to figure out how to get this person calm and let them know everything's okay. So, no, I mean, I think it's, I think it's great. You have an amazing outlook. You've been through um, you know, uh, more than the average person has been through in a lifetime. And, you know, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm appreciative of you being a leader in the industry and being vulnerable and transparent. And there's not enough of that in, in our industry and just in the world in general, like, yeah. you know, we've been taught that, uh, showing vulnerability is a sign of weakness when actually it's quite the opposite to let someone know that you're hurting or to let someone know that you're depressed or having trouble or even mm -hmm. asking for help. That's really hard to do. Yeah. And it shows that, you know, you're, you're not above um, reaching out to someone because that's very difficult for people, you know? Well, and so you I, know, I, I think we're all very appreciative of you. I tell people, I still like people look at me and they think I have it all together. I said, I don't, I still wake up some days and I feel like I want to cry. It is so yeah. stressful sometimes, but just knowing that those feelings are normal is with the end and not thinking everybody else has it figured out and you don't, because that's what everybody does. They look at church and they would see me and my six children and my gorgeous husband on the front row. And they thought we had it all figured out when the reality is our life turned out to be a disaster, you know? Mm -hmm. So you got to know that everybody didn't have it all figured out. You know, we're all responsible for ourselves. Bad things are going to happen to good people. You know, life is 10% of what happens to you and 90% of how you react. But as long as you get up and you give your best every day, 
and you try to figure out what you can do better and you don't get complacent, then you're going to be successful. And, and if you can look up, no matter what happens to you, you can get up. I love it. I love it. And I want everyone to, uh, to go to venusmorrisgriffin.com. I want you to get on the wait list for her book. Uh, show that support. I'm excited to read it. I just got on the wait list. When's the book coming out? So that's out of my hands. I've got a publicist in California and then um, I had a, a writer to really, she gives me all the credit, but she really deserves the credit because she met with me for a year to put everything in words. She's in Utah. So they are working with different people over the country. So it'll be this year, but I don't really know when, which is why I guess they have that little, little wait list. But yeah, and now I mean, my kids build up just, that list. I, I say now, you know, my kids, my oldest is 25, 23, 21, tw wait, 21, 19, 13, 11. And then at 44, um, I had a menopause baby. And so I have a five-year-old. Um, but the, the, I'll tell you the best gift I've ever gotten in my life. My son is will be uh, Dr. John Morris. Next year, this time he's in dental school. He's the president of his class. And I'll never forget when he gives the address as the president to all the faculty at the university and all of the students and their families, he ended it. He says, you know, I can't end this talk without saying <laughs> when all of the world gave up on my family and my mother suddenly loses my dad and he's put in prison. Not a, I don't know of another woman that could pick up a cross and carry it in, in, with six children with nothing but I will be Dr. John Morris because of the example that my mother has given to us. So those kind of things, you know, you don't get that until, you know, my husband, ex-husband has been in prison 10 years, but you don't really see what you're doing. You don't get the rewards of it until later. But if you know I'm doing the right thing that you're going to get it, you know, there's not much, nothing can, no amount of money I make can ever give me the kind of gratitude and gratefulness that, you know, that does. So. Yeah, I love it. I appreciate you being here and uh, sharing your story. Everyone in the chat is saying you're incredible and inspiring, <laughs> and I agree. Um, so, Venus, thank you for being here. It's been awesome thank talking you to you good. and getting to know you, and we're all rooting for you. And you've given us a lot to um, you've given us a lot of inspiration and motivation, which we all need, especially now getting through a pandemic. It's you know people are in a lot of people are in a lot of bad places right now. So we appreciate you. Um, you know, being strong for us and, and telling us your story. So hope everyone got something out of this. I'm sure you did. Uh, have an amazing day, Griffin. Uh, what's going on by your last name? Venus. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Thank you.